All right, excellent. All right, good afternoon, everyone, depending on what time zone you're in. Welcome to this webinar on future proofing natural history collections. And Beth, if you want to go on ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to start off by thanking all of you for being here today and spending time with us. We also wanted to start by thanking the National Science Foundation. So this webinar is going to be talking about the, the material and content that was presented at a project and a workshop that was funded by the National Science Foundation through the Division of Biological Infrastructure. So we wanted to start off by thanking NSF for funding this important work. And next slide, please, Beth. Um, a few instructions as we um, begin. So for everyone who is attending, please mute your audio. That'll just make sure that the sound quality is as good as possible for everyone um, and that everyone can hear the presenter. So thank you all very much. Um, we do encourage you to submit questions. There'll be some time at the end of the presentation for our panelists to respond to questions. Um, when you do submit questions, please use the chat function in the webinar. And um, please make sure that you send your question to everyone so that all of our presenters can see your question. Um, and because we have so many people who are in, in attendance right now, it is very unlikely that we'll get to everyone's question. Um, but we are in the process, we'll record everyone's question and potentially follow up with a blog post or some other kind of response to as many of them as we can. So thank you very much. Um, if you do have any technical difficulties, we do have someone who um, is available to respond. You can email Anthony at the email address on the screen. And what I'm going to do is actually um, send a chat to everyone. So you will have um, that email address handy if you need it. So, and just a reminder to please mute yourself um, if you are attending so that everyone can hear. Thank you. And next slide, Beth. Elizabeth, please. All right. So the, um, the workshop and project that began this effort is a collaborative one between the Ecological Society of America, the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History, and the American Alliance of Museums. Yeah. And next slide. So you're going to get to hear from three people today. My name is Jill Parsons. I'm the Associate Director of Science Programs at the Ecological Society of America. And you'll also get to hear from Elizabeth Merritt from the American Alliance of Museums. Um, I'm just going to interrupt and ask people to mute if possible. I'm hearing a little bit of feedback, so thank you. And Jill, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit mute all and then I'm going to unmute. All right, I've gone through every menu I can <laughs> All right, so I believe everyone can hear me now. Yeah. Um, awesome. So our second speaker will be Elizabeth Merritt. She's at the American Alliance of Museums and she's the Vice President of Strategic Foresight and she's also the Founding Director of the Center for the Future of Museums. And then finally, we're gonna hear from Judy Gradwell, the President of the San Diego Natural History Museum. And next slide. So. Um, the workshop that began this effort happened in December 2016, um, and I wanted to just go over some of the original goals and objectives of that event. So um, one of the main goals was to identifying and quantifying the value of research collections. Um, and in addition to that, also starting to link some of that value to public support. Um, secondly, another objective of that workshop was to examine the impact of current trends on collection sustainability. In addition, um, folks at that workshop tried to identify new economies to support research collections. So throughout this entire three-day event, um, there was a goal of trying to foster an entrepreneurial approach to sustainability and sustaining these collections. 
the workshop itself had about two dozen participants and they represented a diverse array of different types of collections and museums. Um, they also represented, they also had different types of roles within these museums. So some of them were directors of museums, some were administrators, some were curators, collections managers, educators, and exhibition specialists. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth Merritt, and she's going to talk more about the material that was presented at that workshop and what we learned. Thank you, Jill. Is my audio okay? Yes, I can hear you. All right. So the reason that the American Alliance of Museums was interested in this project is that financial sustainability is one of our three areas of strategic focus. And that's because what we hear from museums is that traditional income streams are being disrupted in so many ways. So we know it's important for us to help improve the ability of museums to make money so they can support their core operations and deliver on their mission, missions and create good jobs and fair wages for their staff. So we started by looking at where money actually comes from. And you'll see that for natural history museums, typically the division is about 42% earned and about 28% contributed or donated, maybe almost 10% from investment income and then like 22% from government support, which is usually local and state, some federal. What's disturbing about this is in our 2017 Museum Board Leadership Survey, one third of museums reported that they were dipping into their financial reserves in order to meet their financial obligations. That's pretty disturbing. So it, 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 it suggests that museums are quite regularly experiencing financial distress. So we started tackling the question, how can we improve what we already do? And how can we build new income streams that are resilient? And ideally, this income will be tied to the double bottom line. It will be both profitable and it will advance the mission. So because of the focus of this grant from the National Science Foundation, we were specifically examining natural history research collections. This is arguably the hardest nut to crack when it comes to associated income. Most people may be vaguely aware that museums have a lot of art or pottery in storage, but most of the people I meet are shocked to learn that a natural history museum might have hundreds of thousands of dead birds. By starting with the hardest case, how do you create financial streams around natural history museums collections, I believe we've come up with some conclusions that are applicable to collections of all types. To begin to tackle that challenge, I worked with my partners at the Ecological Society of America and the Peabody Museum at Yale and with James Chung of Reach Advisors to map out the ways that museums can connect their resources to income. And we identified three motivators for these income streams. One is what you might call transactional. It's classic capitalism. You find somebody willing to buy what you produce at a price that sustains your ability to do it. Of course, the vast majority of museums can't do this. Uh, they can't support themselves on transactional funding. In fact, on average, for every dollar a museum earns per museum visitor, typically it has to find $3 from other sources in order to be able to keep its door open or care for collections and conduct research. The second motivation is what you might call third party transactional, in which somebody pays you to produce a good for somebody else. So they're not buying it for themselves, they're buying it for a third party. Many forms of foundation philanthropy or government funding falls into this category. For example, you might get a grant to produce an educational program for at-risk youth. And then the last category, which of course museums love, is value-based, in which people are willing to pay you to support your mission in a, as a good in and of itself. Now, usually pitches for collections funding are values-based, grounded in the premise that the funder shares our belief that collections are a public good in and of themselves. Some, some are third-party transactional. We might get grants to study collections to answer practical questions about conservation or epidemiology. Uh, and that, that grant might have some funding rolled in for collections care and processing. But we started this workshop with the premise that research collections could build income streams around any of these motivations if we think broadly and creatively about who might value our resources for their own re reasons. So what we did at the workshop is we created 
profiles of fictional museums that we assigned to groups of participants. So like there was a small private nonprofit with diverse natural history collections, mostly local. Uh, one was a university museum with a six million dollar budget and internationally important collections. One was a big national museum in the UK. And we challenged these groups to spend a few hours coming up with proposals for potential new ventures based on the collections and the resources that are built around the collections. And we got pitches like an entomology collection that proposed providing consulting services to local farmers based on remote monitoring and data analysis. And an astrophysics collection that planned to license digital data to filmmakers and games designers. I thought that one was very promising. And a collection that proposed to provide therapeutic services to older adults, basically uh, volunteerism and engagement as a form of therapy. When we assessed those various pitches, we used what's called the matrix map to see how they fell into a system that rated them by profitability and by mission impact. So this is a map that you can access at the web address I provided, nonprofit sustainability. Actually, they have a number of free resources about how to use this system in your own organization. Basically, the sweet spot that we're looking for is the upper right-hand quadrant, high mission impact and high profitability. Um, a lot of what museums do are in the lower right, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the upper left, high mission impact and low profitability. These are a lot of the great programs we do that don't have sufficient funding. Um, there are things that museums get sucked into doing and get addicted to that are in the lower right-hand quadrant, like that are low mission impact and high profitability. That's things like maybe, I would argue, Halloween walks or festivals of life. And then it's surprising how many museums analyze what they're doing and find there are a number of things that are low mission impact and low profitability that actually they should stop doing. So for example, fundraisers or galas when you total up the total cost of the staff time to run them actually turns out they aren't running a profit. What we're doing as a follow-up to the workshop is continuing to share real-world examples of museums that have found things that fall somewhere into that upper right-hand quadrant that have high mission impact and moderate to high profitability. What we've concluded is there are some reasonable goals for doing this kind of work, trying to find income streams built around research collections. Some of those reasonable goals include raising awareness of the fact that we even own research collections and what they're for. We can't begin to cultivate public support unless there's a knowledge that we hold these things. Another reasonable goal is cultivating relationships with people who might come to care about our mission and the intrinsic good of these collections. Another good is increasing the financial literacy and responsibility of the staff. Often collections staff aren't trained and equipped to think in financial ways about income streams. And then last of all, it may in fact generate some income um, to support operations in a modest way uh, or actually generate some capital to start up and try new projects. What we concluded was unrealistic is that a research collection is ever going to become self-sufficient from earned income. Now, you might all say, well, that's obvious, but we wanted to go into this with an open mind, and the consensus was, no, you're not going to do this. Uh, but it's worth remembering that even if these programs never becomes financially self-sufficient, those other things we talked about, um, like cultivating relationships that is a really reasonable goal, could lead to an endowment gift that might support a whole position. Um, and also there might be ripple effects of this work that are beneficial in any case. It might control the focus of your work. It might help you understand the long-term costs of uh, amassing this amount of material that need to be processed and stored and building those costs into the institutional budget and other income streams. Okay, so here are four ways that we experimented with creating new income streams around research collections. Um, the first is creating derivative products from collections or data. The second is building on existing capacity or services. The third is providing experiences 
and the fourth is value added around content and stories. And I'm going to very quickly run you through each of these models with a real world example of each. Okay, derivative products. My first example is from the Field Museum of Natural History, and you'll find I have a couple of examples from the Field Museum in this presentation. And this example is about alcohol. The Field Museum has relationships with many uh, alcohol producers, vineyards, breweries, and distilleries due to the fact that the museum actually has its own liquor license and purchasing programs. So one of their products is Field Gin, which was created in partnership with Journeyman Distillery to celebrate the museum's 125th anniversary. And it's made with 27 botanicals selected from a list of over 1,500 botanicals from around the world that were displayed at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. Interesting point, the museum itself had its origin in that World's Fair. Another joint product with Journeyman is Field Vodka, which is distilled from um, Illinois-grown Bloody Butcher Corn, which is an heirloom variety. But they have other joint projects as well. So for example, they took the owners of Off Color Brewing on a behind the scenes tour of the museum's collections. And one of those owners went on to create a beer based on his interest in South American beers and brewing and based on an analysis of pots discovered in a museum excavation. Another one of the founders was interested in Asian styles of beer, and he based his brew on artifacts discovered during museum archaeological digs in China. Now, some of the profits from these projects come from direct income and sales, but another of the FMNH brewery partners is Chicago's Two Brothers Brewery, which has developed a number of what they call philanthropic beers to benefit local nonprofits. So for example, for the Field Museum, they created Cabinet of Curiosities, I'd buy that, with the proceeds going to the museum's education programs. I really like that these collaborations weren't just naming opportunities, they were thoughtful explorations of the collections themselves and how they might inform the products. So there's one example of partnering with a commercial firm to create derivative projects based on collections and data. The next category I want to look at is building on capacity. This is museums monetizing things that they already do by doing it for income for external clients. Uh, often this is commercial services based on the museum's core expertise. For example, it could be conservation treatment or archaeological assessments or rescue mandated by development regulations or digital services. The good news is it's museums getting paid to do things they may want to do anyway. The flip side is these programs can be victims of their own success. Uh, staff in programs like this might feel pressured to give preference to profitable external contracts rather than the museum's own needs. Uh, I know some of the digital labs that have started up at museums have been so successful that they felt like they were doing more and more of their digital work for external clients and didn't have enough capacity to really serve the original needs for the museum. We're going to hear more about one example under this kind of income from Judy Gradwall later in the webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about the next source of income we identified, which is providing experiences. Uh, this is also the, under the heading of making money from things you want to do anyway. It includes, for example, running field schools or research expeditions on a pay-to-play basis. I think there's a real potential for higher income from this category because we're living in an experience economy. Since 1987, the share of consumer spending on live experiences and events relative to total US consumer spending increased 70%. Uh, the immersive entertainment industry is valued at over $4.5 billion, and that's not even counting theme parks. In real life, location-based experiences are projected to become a $12 billion industry by 2023, and museums can provide authentic, meaningful experiences. Uh, people want to contribute to research. They want to feel like their experience is yielding something of enduring value. So why shouldn't museums capture some of the income from this market? And as a legitimate educational experiences, some museums are offering academic credit for this kind of work as well. 
Now, most of the museums I've talked to that run these kinds of schools and expeditions actually have low profitability. Their covering costs are modestly over. But I wonder if it's because they're undercharging compared to what the market will bear. So I'd love to hear from some of you, if you run programs like this, to hear more about your economics. Then the last form of monetizing collections I want to talk about isn't as well established. It's using content and expertise to create what is, in effect, a media channel. I'm going to start with an example that caught my attention that's actually from a sports museum, but it really demonstrates the potential for this format. The National Baseball Hall of Fame partnered with a firm called Teamworks Media to launch a lifestyle media company called La Vida Baseball in 2017. And it offers video, articles, social media content designed around the interest of the Latino community about baseball. And it reaches more than 10 million US Latino-based ball fans every month. The business model's based on reaching an underserved niche market. And it has income from advertising, from content licensing, syndication, from events, and e-commerce. It secured partnerships with Major League Baseball and Tops and 47. And in addition to generating earned income, here's one of the spin-off effects. The channel connects the Hall of Fame with a new generation of potential donors. Now, I wanted to find a museum example, and sure enough, one example we found, um, and that was prominently featured at the workshop, is again from the Field Museum of Natural History, the Brain Scoop. So in 2013, the Field Museum hired Emily Grassley as their chief curiosity correspondent. And at the same time, they acquired a popular YouTube channel she had already started called The Brain Scoop. She started it when she was a volunteer at the University of Montana Zoological Museum. And the channel explores the behind the scenes workings of natural history museums in general and the field museum collections and research in particular. It's been named one of New Media Rockstar's top 100 channels. It has over a half million subscribers. The videos have received almost 29 million views. With that kind of reach, you can try and build an income stream around it. So in fact, they tested an income model based on producing content for other organizations, and they have produced videos on contract for the National Museum of Natural History, and they received grant support for specific content from several private funders, including the National Science Foundation, who funded their work with the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. And now, based on the popularity and reach of the Brain Scoop, PBS and WTTW Chicago have contracted with the Field Museum for Grassley to produce and host Prehistoric Road Trip, which is a three-hour series on paleontology in the Northern Great Plains that will air this coming summer. Now, here's another example of spin-off effects. Building on the fan base of the Brain Scoop video channel, in 2016, the Field Museum of Natural History ran a crowdfunding campaign that raised over $155,000 via, via the Indiegogo platform to build a new hyena diorama in the museum's Asian Hall of Mammals. So there you're taking one form of distribution, which is a fan base built through the video series, and inviting them to become donors. Being a futurist, I always have to think, where could this go next? So I wanted to throw out one idea that actually hasn't uh, become reality yet, but I think it could be. We're seeing a rising desire on the part of foundations and ultra high worth individual donors to have a measurable impact on the world. And one of the things they're doing to pursue that goal is to create what they call pooled philanthropic funds targeting specific causes. So for example, you have the END Fund, which is trying to cure neglected tropical diseases. You have the Freedom Fund, combating slavery around the world. You have the Blue Meridian Group, which is fighting poverty. Through these funds, philanthropists hope to consolidate enough money to make change on a global scale. And the Bridgespan Group has estimated that when such aggregated funds become a common asset class, it could spur another $5 billion in annual giving. So here's my question. In the future, could museums present a case that would significantly increase giving by ultra wealthy donors? To do that, we'd have to identify a measurable goal for, for the impact of our work. 
what's the museum equivalent of ending homelessness or eradicating polio or ending poverty? I think natural history museums have a fair chance at being the segment of the field that comes up with that cause because I think it could be something like making a measurable contribution to preserving biodiversity or to combating climate change. At this point, I wanted to invite uh, our other co-presenter, Katie Bradwall, to jump in and tell us a little bit more about how she has created at her organization, the San Diego Natural History Museum, a culture in which staff feel welcome to have ideas like this and to test them out. Because of course, it's one thing to have an idea and another thing to nurture it to the point where you can actually see if it worked and implement it. So Judy, I have unmuted you, or at least I'm trying to unmute you. Just unmuted myself. Can everybody, hear, can everybody hear me? I can hear you, you sound good. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting us to participate in, in this webinar. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be uh, singled out uh, for, for the work that we're doing here. And I also have to say, I have been at the museum for three and a half years, and I inherited a situation of a, of a fairly entrepreneurial culture um, to begin with. We have nearly 40 years of experience doing um, paleontological mitigation and uh, more recently, but also a very a growing business in biological uh, consulting. So we're aided both by an entrepreneurial culture in the, in the science department and the California Environmental Quality Act, which requires uh, th this level of mitigation and uh, monitoring of endangered species. I'm also, I just learned, joined by, by many colleagues here at the museum, so um, I hope they will pop up on the uh, chat if, if I'm uh, misspeaking at all. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. I wanted to start by, um, by showing that our income streams are fairly different from, from many other museums. In the upper right is admissions. The lower um, tan, these are horrible colors, but the lower um, tan piece is our contract income, which is mostly the paleontological mitigation and the biological uh, consulting services, and then contributions on the, in the sort of Kelly Green there. So uh, a huge amount of our income comes from these contract services, and it covers most of the expenses of the science departments. As anyone um, who works in museums know, there's tremendous additional expenses in terms of just keeping the building going. And so uh, they, they cover, they cover a, a, a very large chunk, the lion's share of the costs of the science department. So in that sense, that's a, that's a success. It's also a huge amount of work every year. And um, the, the paleontological mitigation is, uh, as, as more and more areas of San Diego become developed, it's, we ha we're having to look farther, farther afield to, uh, to keep, the, keep the workload uh, in place. Next slide shows our collections. And I wanted to say that our, our uh, strategy says that we lead with our science. So our collections are and our research are the basis of what we do. We all believe very firmly that this is one of the major values we bring to the world is our collections and our, and our research over the years. We are 145 years old. And so we are the keepers of the ecological record in this region, which stretches from uh, point Conception south to, which is near Santa Barbara, south to the tip of Baja, the, this part of the California floristic region, which if anybody follows um, biodiversity hotspots, it's one of the 35 biodiversity hotspots in the world. So not only are we keepers of this ecological record, we are sitting in a very important um, place in terms of biological diversity of the planet. And uh, the hotspots are defined based on how much habitat has been lost and how many endemic species there are. And so we are um, 
we have the record for a lot of places that don't exist anymore. But the uh, the uh, collections, this is a by way of saying the collections are extremely important. And I also wanted to point out paleontology, which is the fourth one down. About two thirds of our specimens in paleontology come in through the mitigation effort. So a scraper is scraping by. We have monitors there, and uh, if if they see something that looks like a specimen, the scraper moves off, and they uh, they take it out in a field cast and take it back into the lab to be to be cleaned up. But not only does it bring in income, but it it keeps all of these specimens out of landfill, and uh, some some incredibly important finds have been have been discovered through this through this paleontological uh, mitigation, which also supports the museum. But I think the reason the next slide I was invited to participate was for this evolutionary venture fund, which started about three years ago. It's and if you want more information about it, there's actually an, a how-to article about how we put it together and how it is working for us in the AAM uh, magazine issue, May, June, 2019, pages 23 to 25. Um, and it started with uh, a desire to create a more risk-tolerant atmosphere in the museum itself and to to sort of unleash the rest of the entrepreneurial um, energy in the museum. And it is uh, entirely funded by outside funds. And I always like to say it's easier to take risks when it's not, uh, you're not risking your bottom line. Uh, and it's administered by staff, which is uh, something we felt was incredibly important as we set it up that this is, uh, staff generated ideas and, and staff are doing the first cut of evaluations. And then we have a, a committee that in, includes some senior management and executive management and some outside people. And we actually have pitch fest the, the same way you would if you were getting venture funding in biotech, which is big in our area. And so we have done uh, three rounds where we're about to do a fourth and we have funded everything from operations related projects like uh, drinking fountains that are bottle refilling stations to uh, this botan botanically themed escape room, which is on the listed on this on this slide. Our, our tiniest project was a, uh, a small grant to create an art cart where just rolls out into the public space and people can do, um, can draw. And, uh, but the, the projects have ranged from probably $1,200 to maybe thirty to $40,000. And uh, the idea was to have them all be high mission. And they weren't, it, the, the initial idea was not how can we make money, but how can we, how can we further the mission? And that's why we named it the Evolutionary Venture Fund the projects are supposed to move us ahead in an evolutionary fashion, um, allow us to sort of take some leaps that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. As it worked out, some of them have, have been also been uh, financial successes. The escape room basically makes its own, basically supports itself. Uh, it does require a lot of staffing and uh, if anyone's been to an escape room, it's a very small group. So, uh, there's there's no way you're going to run uh, a lot of people through through this one hour experience during the day or night and it and requires staffing so it's not it, it's probably more mission than um, than uh, financial uh, return on on that one but the thing that's pictured on this slide is our rooftop area that we we invested a small amount of funds in fixing up. Anybody else who runs a museum knows that you live close to the edge in a nonprofit. And so we didn't even have the funds to buy the furniture, which people are using and to, and to repaint in order to open this rooftop. But uh, Elizabeth mentioned earlier the importance of a liquor license. This is how we make our money up here on the rooftop is through um, alcohol sales we do uh, we have a essentially restaurant and bar that we open uh 
we're going to be opening one night uh, a week in the summer. We keep the museum open, but we also use it for uh, events and rentals, and it has been a very popular destination. We have also funded some science-related uh, pieces, and I'm going to skip to the in breeding habitat for endangered frogs because uh, uh, that has, uh, relates to um, the impact philanthropy. This is a wonderful project looking at red-legged frogs, which have been uh, extirpated from Southern California, but there, is, there are populations in Northern Baja, California. And so we funded money for bulldozers to dig ponds and if you, if you dig a pond, they will come and they will breed. And uh, the small amount of investment that we made in the, in the um, both digging ponds and some genetic work, $21,000, has been matched by um, donations. And everyone's very excited about this particular project. So uh, once again, it sort of jump-started philanthropy. But the next slide um, is, is probably the one that's most relevant to people who have collections. And this is a botanical imaging station. It's not a scanner. As you can see, it allows uh, our staff and our volunteers to put uh, herbarium sheets in face up. It takes, it takes about two minutes to uh, create several different uh, resolutions of images. And you can see uh, this is one of our staff first people. She is also barcoding and, and processing this, this particular um, specimen. But the, the interesting thing about this was we, we uh, invested $7,000, a little less than $7,000, uh, because we wanted to digitize a collection that we had from neighboring Imperial County. But once we had this uh, scanner in place, this uh, digital imaging station available, we received contracts from a couple of small herbariums that were being held in uh, military um, property because they didn't want, they didn't want to have uh, possession of the specimens, but they wanted to keep the digital images. So they basically paid us to process uh, to process their collections, which we then accessioned into our collections. And, uh, and because we were able to use uh, volunteers, it more than covered the costs. And so the initial investment has been made back many, many times over. And I believe that is the end of my slides. Well, this is a good way, place to segue to some um, discussion and question and answer. I was very interested to hear what you said about the model of the army paying you to create the digital scan, the digital images of material they then reposited with you. Michael Wall asked a question about the unfunded mandate of of um, natural history museums expect being expected to serve as voucher repositories. And it seems like here's a, a situation where you, I'm not saying these were vouchers, but you built uh, a, a situation in which essentially the collections were put in your care, but they came with their endowment through, well, endowment in meaning a dowry. They come with financial support attached to the creation of digital images. Well, Michael is our chief scientist, so he can't speak to this. Hey, Michael. <laughs> But they didn't come with any funding. They just came with the specimens. We were paid to, right. to digitize them. Yeah, so you essentially built an income stream around accepting them that, that generated the income that funds their care. I think it's interesting because this, this question, Michael, um, connects to a broader one I was looking at this year as I wrote the next edition of Trends Watch, which is about financial sustainability which is the question of how often do nonprofits in general and museums in particular back themselves into a corner because we give things away for free and then train people to expect that the price point is free and then they get indignant when they're asked to pay for it. And sometimes it seems to be free because somebody has funded us to do it. That goes back to this third party um, uh, capitalism where a funder might say, oh, you, I want to fund you to do this, and then you're going to turn around and give the service or the product away for, quote, free to the people using it. But 
if we've trained people that we will accept material for free, how do we then try and attach a price tag to it? And it's hard because you know there is a moral obligation to save some of this stuff. But on the other hand, unless we start creating a norm in which people should be paying us to reposit it, that that's part of what they build into their economic model when they write a grant or plan an expedition, um, we're always going to be fighting an uphill battle. Elizabeth, this is Jill. There's been an additional question asking to define the term voucher repository. I was wondering if you wanted to take that one on. Oh, I think I should leave it to um, Judy since she's actually working in a museum. With <laughs> I could. Okay, I just unmuted. Uh, the um, we call we call our specimens vouchers because they vouch for the existence of that particular individual at that point in time, um, and and always point out that specimens with no data associated with them are are worthless to us. So it's the it's the specimen and the data that uh, provide, that vouch for that, that specific individual. But vouchers also are, um, more importantly, when a new species is being described, it is the type specimen or the voucher. And those are, those are safeguarded. I know when I worked at Smithsonian, they were under lock and key. It's one of the reasons why the fires in Brazil were so tragic because they lost many of the type specimens. And without those, it's very difficult to go back and understand why that, why that was considered a species, what, how, how its genetics or its, its, uh, its uh, taxonomy relates to, to other species. Anyone who works in, in this field knows that things are constantly being reclassified and and it's necessary to go back and look at type specimens or the voucher specimens in order to do that that research so those are we keep those in the public trust forever and as, as michael points out no one very few people understand or care the about about the importance of that but that is that is extremely important and mm -hmm. uh, you know we keep the air conditioning running at the correct temperature in the botany in the herbarium so that we can preserve those specimens even if it's um, causing us financial problems elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so, Judy, oh sorry. I was just going to um, take another link with Judy. Uh, Patrick Larkin, hello Patrick, comments that California's high amount of environmental and other regulations seem to have created opportunities for your museum that other states may not have. Do you have thoughts on how your consulting efforts may or may not translate to other parts of the country? Boy, uh, Michael, do you want to do you want to unmute and and take this one if you're still on? I I believe it is. We are. Am I, am I allowed to unmute? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, certainly that California has a very stringent laws regarding this relative to a lot of other areas of the country. Um, interesting, the paleontological part that we, that really a lot of this entrepreneurial spirit started under is um, it's only enforced by municipalities. So there are municipalities within the country or within the, within the state that don't enforce it. And we're fortunate that San Diego happens to be a municipality that does enforce this. But, you know, um, Paleo is its own special thing, but it, but there's, you know, biological consulting is a huge um, piece of pie across all states. Uh, and I think where we've really found our niche within the biological consulting realm is through our taxonomic expertise and having uh, people particularly working with conservation of endangered species, listed species, state listed species, really making sure that we've got the staff on hand to be able to, um, to be specialists within that area. And um, people come to us, typically we act as subcontractors for much larger projects that might have to do with wetland delineation and all this sort of stuff, but we're, we're in there for um, specific expertise. So yeah, it's hard to, it's, it's, it's a little bit apples and oranges, but I, I think within the realm of biological consulting, that's, probably the most applicable 
across a lot of regions. So I see another question in the chat box that also relates to consulting. And I don't know if Judy or, or maybe Michael wants to take this one as well, but it's asking about consulting and does it take away from a curator's time at the museum? How do um, curators consult and then also get paid to do so without there being a conflict of interest? Michael, I'm gonna let you jump in because you <laughs> has, to, has to juggle this. Yeah, sure. So yeah, absolutely. It's a problem, right? It, uh, clearly, it takes away from research time because you can't, you know, time's a, a limited resource. Um, but uh, the, the conflict of interest part, we, we don't, they're, they're, they're not consulting as individuals. The, we're having organizations are um, contracting with the museum and the curators and the researchers and the staff are um, working through the museum to do that consultancy. So there's no, you know, there's no conflict there. Um, and, you know, theoretically people aren't moonlighting, you know, outside of the, the museum's uh, efforts. Um, and then how do you find that balance? Boo, you know, that's, you, we, we just try really hard to um, make sure that the projects that we are working on from a consultancy perspective fall into that high mission quadrant of um, the graph that uh, Elizabeth showed earlier and uh, really try to not do the things that fall in the bottom left bottom left hand quadrant that don't serve the mission don't serve the collections don't serve research we're not going to do that and then the other thing that we we have to you know think about is our role um, in our identity within the conservation, you know, as, as a conservation oriented organization, we're not going to take contracts that like, you know, are looking to pave over a wetland of some kind. So we, we do have to be really choosy about it. Thank you, Michael. There's a very interesting discussion going on in the chat about escape rooms. I've been studying because so many museums have really cool mission and subject related escape rooms, even if they're not directly related to research collections that I know of most of the time. But several people have commented, you know, Judy, you said earlier that yours basically breaks even, but some people are saying it depends because escape rooms that are marketed towards companies as team building opportunities may make more money. I think that's a really pointed comment about when you're trying to hone income streams like this to maximize the profit once you're happy with whatever their consistency with your mission is, uh, that you look who has the money. There's the old joke about why do people rob banks because that's where the money is. And the fact is companies have generally um, higher price points they're willing to pay than individuals. You may be familiar with the museum tour company called Museum Hack that does very sort of irreverent high energy tours of museum collections and you, have, you might have a museum where the public is complaining about paying a $25 entrance fee, but they're willing to pay museum hack $100 to go on one of their tours. I was interested to learn from a podcast episode in which they dug into their business model, the vast majority of their income is coming from team building exercises with corporations. The actual public tours are a very small slice of their profitability. So you may be doing something that is modestly profitable with one group that could have a higher profit margin more than other. Yeah, and if I can just jump in here, um, our, as, as I mentioned, our ideal number in the escape room at any one time is six people. And so um, teams are often larger than that. I mean, we do, we do have corporate team building um, rentals of, of the escape room. It's just, the way ours is ours was not set up to run large numbers of people yeah. through and so if you just look at the number of hours in the day that people are available to do it and you're running six through per hour yeah. sometimes we can run it with two people um as well so it's it's just i think um because it was set up more with mission and experiment in mind and and it was we didn't we weren't looking at how to at how to make it more of a more of a you know mill but uh but i it it probably is possible the other thing to know about is there is uh 
a level of fatigue after after people have done it once they will not do it again because it's the same problem so you you need to have the ability to change it over and we're looking at that now about whether whether we want to create a new one uh, and but what we're finding is it's also it's also fabulous image advertising for the museum uh, is people it's a very cool thing for us to do and it's helping us uh, become less of a dusty old natural history museum so sometimes Sometimes the mission is education, sometimes it's image, sometimes it's there, it's it's you know earning money. It, right now it's it's a good sweet spot for us, but we're 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 actively wrestling with all the advantages and disadvantages of having it right now. I think it's a good point of the cost of keeping something like that fresh. This is a good point to point to um, emphasize the benefits of finding partner organizations that can help with this work because somehow it meshes what they want to do. I was just reading recently about the, um, let's see, which museum is it? The Niagara Military Museum that worked with Brock University. They got their students from the Dramatic Arts and Interactive Arts and Science programs to come design their escape rooms. And they have a number of different programs they run there for escape rooms. And that's part of the students' uh, design project. So, serves the university's desire to find meaningful and interesting projects for the students to take on and the museum gets periodic refresh and, and the intellectual and design expertise to come up with fun interactive experiences. Ah, so somebody is saying it's interesting that so many natural history museums have the reputation of being for kids but all of these ideas seem to be for a more adult audience. I'll just quickly point out that uh, when we look at visitor surveys, we do have a large proportion, it's nearly half of our, of our audience comes without kids. So it's, it, I think that's the, that's the part that a lot of museums uh, overlook is that there, there, there are quite a few adults and adults are interested in learning and in natural history. And so uh, that, that's, uh, that was part of our, of our uh, discussions in setting this stuff up. Does anybody else want to lob any questions at our presenters? So this is Jill. We did receive a couple of questions in advance of the webinar and this, um, discussion about you know who comes to museums um who is thought of as a typical audience relates to one of them and um one of the questions was what is the typical model for brand development for natural history museums and how do collections factor into that model um i think elizabeth and judy you've touched on this a little bit but i just wanted to check in to see if there's anything else you wanted to say along those lines I can pull a little on my Smithsonian experience where I was before this, and uh, and we licensed plush animals. I don't know if they're still, doing <laughs> that, but you know, based on based on collections, and, mm -hmm. and so you know, if people are making new discoveries, possibly you could you could license uh, things related to that. Once again. You just have to look at the margins and I, I think one of the really important lessons we learned in the evolutionary venture fund is it's not enough just to build it you need to build in marketing and so it, your expenses go way up with with a lot of things I mean you can have a great idea but if if you can't market it properly or um, manufacture it properly or deal with the inventory it it's not our primary business and so we don't always we don't always know all the steps that are involved in doing that. So I'd like to tackle a question that Erin Richardson just lobbed. Um, she comments that outside of the venture fund and pooled philanthropy, many of these ideas seem to be band-aids rather than future-proofing. Uh, these are some of the most expensive collections to care for in the long term, anything out there with significant financial impacts. This is where I'd like to make my pitch that the fundamental financial model for research collections is that they are a shared public good. And the financial model for supporting shared public good is government funding. Unfortunately, 
we're living in a present where I don't see any credible short-term path to a future in which we get significantly more government funding for collections in the US. I think that what a lot of these projects do go back to the ripple effects I mentioned. One of the biggest barriers to building public support for bearing the costs of research collections is people don't know we have them, they don't know what they are, and they don't know what good they do. I think projects like this multiplied by all of the different things that natural history museums do and the number of natural history museums in the country have the potential to educate significantly larger numbers of people about the fact that this stuff is here, it's important, and it does interesting things. So for example, the Field Museum got phenomenal press out of the Field Museum gin. And to me, what really thrilled me wasn't the alcohol itself, though that's pretty cool. So there were major publications talking about their botanical collections and how they were formed and what was in them and the significance. So I think that to the extent we have the possibility in the future of building more robust public support for government funding of bearing the costs of these public goods, it's through the multiplier effect of all these projects that help win the hearts and minds of people who come to know what we've got and understand their value. Sorry, I didn't mean to drop a mic there. <laughs> <laughs> So I, we might have time for one more question. Um, there's another one about consulting, asking about how do fees for consulting compare to what private sector consultants are paid? Um, do curatorial staff prepare the completing contracts? And if so, how are they trained to do so? Michael, you wanna take that? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, so, you know, we uh, are very uh, cognizant and, and, you know, think about what the market will bear um, in terms of the fees that we charge with, and, you know, we're, we're not, we're certainly not, not going to do it. We're not going to undercut ourselves. Um, so we're constantly looking at the rates uh, that we're, we use for our contracting services. Um, the so one thing that we just invested in recently to, that I've realized I should have addressed when we were talking about balancing um, business versus research with, from the curatorial perspective is that we did um, recently hire someone specifically into the role of being the director of our biological services. And that is their job. Their job is contingent upon um, doing this research oriented or excuse me, contract oriented work. And um, together with our back office accounting, CFO, COO people, those, that's how we deal with the contractual side of things. I mean, that said, like Judy prefaced, it's been a very entrepreneurial culture here for a long time. And, and a lot of folks are, are um, in, amazingly business savvy. I think what's really great about what you've done, Judy and Michael, is create a culture in which people are willing to try these experiments and take these risks because they might not all work. But unless you're willing to try some experiments that don't work, you won't be able to find the ones that do. I'm going to segue here to our last slide, which is how to follow our work. And I'm sharing here the Twitter handles and web addresses for places to follow the Ecological Society of America the Center for the Future of Museums and the San Diego Natural History Museum. Our intent is to take this recording, I hope it came out well, and embed it in posts on the blog, on the web. I know I can put it on the CFM blog, on the Alliance website. Jill, I believe you were gonna look for a way to share it through ESA as well? Yes, yeah. And one of the things I will also do is if we can export the group chat, um, if we see any questions that we didn't get a chance to answer during the webinar, I'll give Judy and Jill a chance to weigh in and we could write up some answers to those as well. I've also been really impressed with the, dis the discussion that you all have been having. It's been really cool to see. Thank you. Thank well, you again thank for having us. Thank you so much for joining us today.